Muncie, Indiana. It's still a fine weekend, even though it was Muncie. Um, let's see, a few announcements. First, um, because of all of the logistical issues that occurred um, surrounding the um, Criminal Justice Reform Symposium, because of power outage and the weather, and having to move the location, uh, and how crowded the room was, um, many of you, or at least some of you, have contacted me to indicate that, um, that you never got a chance to sign the sign-in sheet, which actually there was one. Um, some of you may not even know there was one. Um, so I have it with me. It's taken a beating, but it's still here. So um, if you have contacted me, I filled in your initials. So you don't have to do it again. Um, or if you're mystified, have my initials get there. I put them there. Um, if you were there, now obviously if you weren't there, don't sign this. Right? It's a matter of your own integrity, but I'm counting on you to be honest. Um, and, but initial if you were there, and I will give you that credit. So there will be two sign-in sheets or roll sheets going around today. Don't mix them up. There's one that has today's date, and there's one that says CJR Sim Symposium. So um, to keep those straight, uh, if you will. I'm going to start both of them right here. Why not? And I'm going to use that. Um, OK, uh, so that's one. Second, uh, if you were at the symposium and you stayed for the whole thing, you know that um, uh, Holly Hayes, who's the uh, director of um, Justice Action Network, announced that, in fact, there will be, as I discussed uh, last week, fellowships for criminal justice reform. There will be four of them for $5,000 each, um, and she, all the details have not been worked out. But, uh, but part of the responsibility of one of these fellows will be to work out in the community with a group that is working on criminal justice reform. Um, because all of the details haven't been worked out in terms of eligibility and the application process uh, and qualifications, um, I don't think we're ready to start that process yet, but I know we're not ready to start that process yet. But we will keep you informed if you are interested. Um, my guess is, and this is only a guess, so don't take it as gospel, that there will that um, that we will the initial group will be um, will consist of two second years and two third years. So currently, those people will be first years and second years because um, it will start next year. It won't start this year. Um, and I am also guessing that we won't know until the spring exactly how we're going to go about making that application process work. Um, and hopefully at some point um, um, we'll be able to get that information to you um, if you are interested. Okay? Um, so that's all I know about that, but I do know it's going to happen. So that's really good news. Um, and I think that's all I have by way of announcements. Oh, oh yeah, I think that's it. Um, so anything on your minds before we resume? And we should finish, and I know we'll finish rape and sexual assault today and begin homicide. So this is no where we are. Anything? OK. Uh, we have one case left to do on, in the material on uh, rape and sexual assault. And then I want to go carefully through chapter 510. Uh, of the KRS. So please have that ready, whether you have it hard copy printed out or whether you have it on uh, uh, your laptop, uh, whatever you have, uh, please have those ready because we're going to go over that pretty carefully uh, as uh, for its own sake because I want you to see uh, the provisions and how each of the offenses differs in that chapter, uh, at least in most of that chapter. And then I also want you to get used to how you read statutes. So it'll also be an exercise in making sure you have that skill so you can read any statute in the criminal code and be able to do something of the same process, okay? But we begin with Commonwealth against Fisher. Fisher, of course, is our defendant. Um, what happened? Who was he and what happened between he and the complainant? Sex, um, and 
says, you know, you want me, and initiated oral sex. Before you get to that, if you were defending Mr. Fisher, what part of their interaction would you point to uh, to support his version of events? Probably the fact that um, he had marks on his body from our sex and that, or the fact that they were in his dorm room um, to begin with. Is there any context we need to know, add in? They had had consensual sex earlier. And that's undisputed. Right? The prosecution does not deny that a couple of hours before the events that are the uh, that uh, lead to this um, to this trial, that they had engaged in consensual sex. So there was a relationship between them. At least some level of sexual contact was consensual. And if I'm the defense, if I'm representing Fisher, I'm going to point to that to say, look, this is part of an ongoing relationship, and that adds to the context. That adds to the context from which he could have believed that, and if we, if he makes, or if he testifies about what was the nature of that contact, uh, how it went, that that supports his idea about what their relationship was like, what their sexual relationship was like. Okay, um, but um, <coughs> what happened later? So um, later they separated and they um, went to. Went with their respective friends um, separately, and then met up two hours later back in the male store. Um, and um, uh, so they end up uh, back in his dorm room, and um, their version about this encounter, as the case puts it, mildly, understatedly, was grossly divergent. Um, what was their? Uh, what, what did the complainant say happened when they got back in the in? The room. Um, she said he locked the door, pushed her on the bed, straddled her, held her wrist above her head, um, forced himself into her mouth, said, I know you want it, and nobody will know where you are. Um, she tried to warn him by saying somebody would look for her and would find out, and she had a mandatory seminar, and she repeatedly said she didn't want sex, um, but then he blocked her couch and she tried to leave, so she needs him in the groin to escape. Now, Ms. Clements since I made her be the defense, can't be the prosecutor, right? That would be, um, that would be A, asking too much, and B, uh, be a conflict of interest and she'd probably get disbarred before she ever passes the bar, okay? So I need somebody to be the prosecutor. If you were gonna select as the prosecution one fact that Ms. Clements just related that would be the point you would want to emphasize or that you would be sure to stress in your case, what would that be? What would that be? When she, said, when she said no, he said no means yes. He, she said no, right? There's no <coughs> dispute that there is a no here. So this is not a case, the prosecution can say, in which there was ambiguity or in which the, the issue, the dispute is whether there should, the law should require affirmative consent, right? There was silence and the question is, well, should, the, should the, the, the defendant have gotten affirmative consent? There was no here. And he just basically ignored it and he says it's, that uh, it was part of that, no means yes, it was part of his at least alleged belief um, and um, and uh, and so that is um, that is a key part. Of it, okay. So what happened, Ms. Clements, when, as the uh, as Fisher puts it, she convinced him that she on, honestly didn't want, it, did um, not want to have sex with him. Well, he says when she said that no, I honestly don't. That's when he he um, he stopped trying to engage in oral sex and got off of her but he continued to kiss her and things and said she enjoyed it and responded to it positively um, and then said that she later got up to leave. Um, he touched her thigh and then she got very angry, said she was getting pissed um, and then left before he could rearrange himself and walk her to class. Okay, so now I need a judge, right? We have prosecutor, we have defendant. Is there any evidence, judge, supporting either of these very different versions of what happened between them, right? Any, diff any, from a neutral perspective, 
there any evidence that you, that you might point to that might support either version? Of course, we're going to leave this to the jury. The jury decides, not the judge. But from a neutral perspective, what, um, what might support either version? Not from his, but not from what he said, or not from what she said. So the, right, she sought treatment. She there was so there was contemporaneous action on her part. Tends to support her version at least of what happened. We're going to get into his belief because the mens rea here is the issue in the case. But her version of events is supported by her subsequent actions. She also told friends, uh, or the, the friends saw her as uh, as the case puts it as nervous, shaken, and upset after the incident. Okay, so there's that's testimony, evidence that you can elicit as the state that says, look, this was really what happened. Her version of events is really what happened. Um, is the defense's position about what, quote, unquote, really happened, their main position? Is Clemens is shaking your head at me? Why are you shaking your head at me? No, um, because they try to argue how he was sexually inexperienced and just believe that she was uh, a reason believe that she was a willing participant, which was reasonable given his experience. So we're going to talk separately, and we both, about defendant, we're going to first talk about defendant's belief that there was consent. Okay? There are three possibilities here, and I think only three. You can correct me if you think I'm wrong about this when I say there's three possibilities. One possibility is that defendant's belief was correct, i.e., there was consent. Okay? That's one possibility. If there was, then he both lacked the mens rea because he believed there was consent and he, there was no actus reus because there was actually consent. It was consensual sex, and that is not the act that constitutes rape. That's one belief, that's one possibility, the belief was correct. The other two possibilities are both possibilities where the belief would be incorrect. So that's number one. Number two is defendant's belief was incorrect but reasonable. Right? There wasn't consent, so I no consent. Unlike possibility one, there was no consent, so there was a mistake, but it was a reasonable mistake under the facts. What's the third obvious, I hope obvious, possibility? Someone? It was incorrect and unreasonable. Defendants. Yeah. was incorrect and unreasonable. So there's still the same as that, no consent. Defendant was wrong, believed there was consent, and the belief was unreasonable under the facts. Okay? If you were arguing for the defendant, what would be your first position? Your, your, the position you would hope that the courts would adopt? Uh, well, I was just going to bring up the fact that um, they met up again later and it was in the appellant's storm room uh, again. So maybe that. I'm not even worried about the application to this case. I will worry about it in a minute. But right now, I just want to keep this in the abstract. If you were going to argue in general for a rule that would be pro-defendant, that would be favorable to the defendant, what would your 
the, what would be the, the role you would most want? That there was consent. I'm sorry? That there was consent. I don't know. But when it comes to belief, when it comes to belief, what rule would you want? That you had to be acting purposely? Like no. No, 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 no. That's not what I'm getting at. Try that, that belief uh, frees you from guilt? Frees you from And Cold does it belief? matter whether it was reasonable or not? No. No. That's you Any belief that you had consent should be a defense. Okay. That's the defense's ideal position. What would be your fallback position? That the belief was correct? No, 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 no. You, that the belief was reasonable? Yeah. Not that the belief was reasonable in terms of what the rules should be. In terms of what the rules should be. I don't care about the facts of the belief in a particular case was correct. That reasonable belief. That only would... a reasonable belief is a defense. The yeah. first thing you can say to the court is, judge, any belief that there was consent should be a defense. But if you don't buy that, at least if it was reasonable. So instruct the jury not to convict. I hope you'll instruct the jury not to convict if they conclude that my client believed there was consent, even if it was unreasonable. But at the very least, instruct the jury that if the belief, there was a belief and it was reasonable, that should be a defense. How could you argue to the judge that, e that you should get the more extreme position? You should get a defense even for unreasonable beliefs that there was consent. What would your argument be? And this is by way, and for those of you who thought you'd left the box exercise behind, and would never have to encounter those legal issues again, I got bad news for you. Here we are again. Right, Mr. Webb? Because they uh, lack the mens rea. They lack the mens rea. So what rule would you state, general rule, that would then apply to this? Is it a possibility? Is it a possibility? Well, it's not impossible if there actually was no consent. The crime could have been committed, but you have negating mens rea. I mean, keep, keep up with that. What, how, how do you decide, what is it that negate mens rea, ne negates mens rea? The defendant's belief as to, in this case it's consent, but more generally. Is it a crime or not? Mm. Fact, a mistake of fact. Use the modern rule, you know what oh, I don't like. the circumstances, what you believe them. The attendant yeah. circumstances, right? This is an application of that rule we had from the MPC you look at the attendant circumstances as the defendant believed them to be. And under the attendant circumstances as the defendant believed them to be, you would argue to the judge, even if the defendant was unreasonable, it would not have been a crime. And therefore, it, he lacks the mens rea, just as we talked about in the box exercise. Right? The mens rea would be negated by this mistake as to the attendant of the attendant circumstances he believed them to be, there was consent, therefore he did not believe or intend to or know, depending on the mens rea, that he was engaging in unconsensual, non-consensual sex. Okay, so that's your argument. Your argument is the mistaken belief re-consent means that defendant's mistake as to the attendant circumstances, the circumstances that exist surrounding the events, negated his men's way. That's the argument. Okay, what's the problem in this case? What's the problem, the first problem the defense encounters on the appeal in this case? sort of a, um, a first obstacle before you ever get to that. Hmm. He's saying that they provided ineffective assistance. Why? Um, and failing 
to request a jury charge. Or right. Or I said you would ex you would you would ask for this jury instruction, right? That the defendant's mistake it negated his mens rea, but the lawyer here didn't ask for that. That's the first problem. You can't raise, the general rule is you can't raise an issue on appeal if you didn't raise it at trial. So if you didn't ask for the jury instruction here on this issue, you can't say, well, the judge should have given this instruction and say that was error and that's a reason to reverse the conviction. So since they didn't raise it below, didn't raise it at trial, what do they have to argue instead? Just said it. Oh, that it was ineffective assistance. That not asking for it was ineffective assistance of counsel. And that's a lot harder row to hoe. Because to focus for just a minute on the issue of ineffective assistance of counsel, to show that counsel was ineffective to the point where it denies a defendant's constitutional rights, you have to show not just that there was error, but that it, no lawyer could possibly have thought that this was a good strategy, essentially, right? That it was so bad, there was no strategic reason it could have been done, there was no competent counsel could possibly have done this. That is a high, high barrier, very high, okay? What's the, and so what's the very first thing that you have to establish? You, that's not gonna be enough, but you definitely have to have at least this for ineffective assistance of counsel. What are you first, what's your first part of that comment? Um, so there's three parts. The first is underlying issue of arguable merit. Um, so, which is to say, translate that into plain English for us. Um, just underlying issue of arguable merit. Yeah, <laughs> like it just means, I think it's an issue like worth looking into. Like it, it's a big enough issue that it, it would have changed the case. That's got its problems. Let's try this one. And that's even worse. <laughs> the red, the reds are not doing well today. It's like the baseball team. Uh, <laughs> the reds are done. Like the red, well, so are those pens. Let's try green. Green seems to work. Much better. Ineffective assistance of counsel. At the very least, if the art if counsel, the attorney, fails to do X, i.e. here ask for a jury instruction, the instruction you're saying he or she should have asked for must have been right. Or an issue of arguable merit. That would be right, right? It may still be that even if it was right, that's not good enough to make it ineffective assistance of counsel, because maybe there was a tactical reason you didn't want the jury to think about that issue. So yes, it would have been a correct instruction, but a reasonable lawyer might have decided, no, let's not focus on that. It's a bad issue for our case. But at the least, it has to have been right. Because you don't even get me on that if it turns out, well, he didn't ask for the instruction because it was wrong. Oh, right, that wouldn't be an effective assistance of counsel. That would be being a good lawyer. So we have to ask, would this have been a correct instruction in the circumstances of this case, okay? And, and in one word, how do we know that this would not have been a correct instruction? You can give it to me in one word. What am I usually looking for when I ask you for one word? Not bird. What? Not. <laughs> Mumbling. What can you, you what can, what's one of the few things you can express in one word? Cool. What? 
You guys are going to have to speak up. <laughs> What can you give me in one word that you, that, when you can't give me in all, almost anything else? I would say culpability. Even Miss Harper is speechless. <laughs> That's rare. <laughs> Where's the lie, though? <laughs> Like she said no. It's not one word. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I didn't say anything. No. That's why I didn't say anything. You can give me a case name. What case well, it, it destroys the argument made uh, by the defendant here? Cheek. <laughs> Cheek. Uh, what case decided in this state, referenced and discussed in this case? No. Williams? Williams! Tell me about Williams. Great. Oh, okay. Uh, now you're regretting that. <laughs> you knew after I asked for one word, I was going to ask for more. <laughs> what had the court said in Williams that makes Fisher's argument? about the, the argument about a belief go collapse. Williams? Um, they say that if, if that element of the defendant's belief as to the victim's state of mind is going to be established as a defense, then that's something the legislature needs to take that's on. That's not what they say about Williams. No, they use Williams much more affirmatively than that. They say it's rape if there's no consent. If what? It's rape if there's no consent. No, uh, we're talking about belief. What is the key element that the court says, if this is present, then the fact, look on 986, that if this is present, then it, then we're not going to allow you to use a belief defense. Is it because she said no? Not because, no, not because she said no. That's not the reasonable compulsion. I'm sorry? They say if there's in, uh, use of force or threats, then Exactly. If there's use of force or threat, a person has sexual relations using force or threats of force, then he has committed rape. And it doesn't matter if he, that he believed, even reasonably, that he had consent. Right? In other words, the court is saying, look, don't come claiming anything about your belief if you use force or threats. If you use force or threats. Because right? we're not... Court points to Williams. <coughs> if force or threats were used, a defense of mistaken belief is unavailable. And here, there was force. The jury could have concluded that there was force. And therefore, the defense is unavailable. And since the defense is unavailable, there was no mistake for the lawyer not to ask for it. And it certainly wasn't ineffective assistance of counsel. Right? So Williams basically explodes the opportunity to argue for this. So the defendant, Fisher, has to try to deal with Williams has to try to distinguish it. What argument does Fisher make that, oh, no, 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 Williams, yeah, it's an obstacle for us, but it, this case is different. It's called? Um, he argues that in Williams, it's stranger rape. Versus? Um, versus the relationship that the defendant has with Williams. And we run here into this issue of what's been the, the terminology of date rape acquaintance rate, whatever terminology you want to use. He says, this is different. And the court says, okay, we grant you that context might be different. On 989, the court says, uh, in a case where we would give greater uh, weight to what is occurring beneath the overt actions of young men and women in a situation where they know each other, but this is not one of those cases because of the allegations of physical force. 
right? The court says this is a case of a young woman alleging <coughs> physical force in a sexual assault and a young man claiming that he reasonably believed he had consent in such circumstances, Williams controls, okay? So the use of force, the court is saying, is inconsistent with a reasonable belief that the victim consented. If you have force, you can't have the belief, and the jury doesn't need to be instructed on it. Then the court talks, or the, the defendant argues, that there have been changes in the understanding and the definition of rape and sexual assault, and that should make a mistaken belief defense available. And he says it's a necessity for a fair trial. And this, on this, for this, the defendant cites Rhodes on page 987, where the Pennsylvania Supreme Court said force can include moral, psychological, or, or intellectual force, not just physical force. And the court and the, the Pennsylvania legislature adopted that position as well. So he says, look, if you're going to use psychological force, um, that gets into the defendant's mental state, and you have to allow the jury to consider uh, that uh, mental state issue. Um, and the problem is that um, the defendant might be applying psychological force regardless of his mental state, right? Regardless of his mental state. And so the question is, was there force? Was there force? So I want to sort of step back from Fisher. Fisher basically says, we're going to reject this mistake issue, this mistaken belief issue on mens rea. Okay? I want to suggest to you that ultimately the question about what we should do with this mistake and mens rea issue is, um, is to recognize that it all comes down to what, how we value and weigh the respective rights at issue here. In every other criminal context, certainly for serious felonies, we would say that you have to have mens rea and that it would violate defendants' rights in a pretty fundamental way to say we're going to allow conviction where there is a, mis certainly a reasonable, you don't even require it to be reasonable, a genuine belief that negates mens rea, because mens rea is absent, okay? And um, the, the question is, and so if we, if we eliminate that, if we sort of say, well, we're not going to apply that rule when it comes to rape and sexual assault, we are compromising defendants' rights that exist everywhere else throughout the criminal law. Okay, mens rea, we're not going to require it to be shown in a case where you genuinely, perhaps even reasonably believe there was consent. On the, so what's the good reason for doing that? Is there sufficient reason for doing that? And the answer, if there is one, if there's a persuasive reason, is that unlike all these other crimes where consent is an issue, if you don't do that, you're compromising the victim's rights. Because the victim has a right not to consent. And if you say, well, there was no consent, because that's true in both two and three, there was no consent. We're assuming that because obviously it's a, otherwise it wouldn't be a mistaken belief, it wouldn't be an incorrect belief. So if the victim is going to have the right not to consent, if we recognize this belief, what, what does that mean? It means we're compromising that right not to consent. We're saying, okay, we know you didn't consent, but we're not going to convict the defendant anyway because of this mistake. So whose right are we going to sacrifice? And where's the right balance? Are we going to sacrifice the defendant's right not to have a men's to to be not convicted in the absence of mens rea, or we're gonna protect the victim's right not to consent. There's gonna to have to be some, some, something has to give in the balance between those, okay? Um, so before I tell you what Kentucky does on this, thoughts, where do we draw the balance? 